promised to be very interesting ones, at least for me. And uh, we're going to start with uh, Professor Stephen uh, Stelzer. He's a professor of philosophy and has been the chair of the Department of Philosophy at the Cairo University, American University of Cairo, or in Cairo. He received his PhD from, <coughs> sorry, from the Freie Universität in Berlin. His areas of specialization are comparative analyses of Western and Islamic concepts of knowledge, as well as the ethical dimension of Islamic education. His particular interest in terms of research is narratives of spiritual trouble, and is going to talk to us today about traveling by night with bridges and channels, the troubles of the prophets. Uh, the entire uh, presentation for each uh, participant will be about half an hour. We have about 20 minutes of presentation. We didn't have time for questions. Is it okay? Okay, right. Will you have five minutes left? I'll let you know. <laughs> and then one minute left, and then we'll have to stop. Thank you very much. Please. And this is working as well. And this is working as well. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, this is a little bit do they hear me? Alright. And the micro works here. You can hear. Okay. Thank you. This is about traveling by night. That's to say a very particular type of journey in many respects. Traveling, journeying, voyaging. So many words for a desire, for thoughts in search of something, for the flowering of imagination, for actions undertaken. Actions, thoughts, imaginations moved by pain or by pleasure, often with good intentions and often enough with bad consequences. It seems that man travels as it was put in ancient descriptions of the soul or dis descriptions of himself, man travels on all levels, physically, mentally, spiritually. And it seems that this human being found it important to accompany those travels by reflections, by notebooks while traveling, or by telling stories of, of their travels or stories telling stories instead of their travels. Is there any literature, any art of storytelling that, that does not know of traveling? Sometimes it takes just one word to set the train of thought moving, one word to fire the imagination, one word for somebody to pick up, pick his bag and go. You know, of course, the, that the English word, that English words like travel, journey, voyage, name something that may be named in other languages too. But they name it in their own way. Travel, strangely, says something of travail, journey of jour, voyage of bois. Having traveled myself, I came across a word that has neither labor, nor day, or way in it, but it is still translated as voyage. It is the Arabic word safa and it has made it onto and into a book called Kitab al-Isfar and Nata'ij al-Asfar, Book of Unveiling the Fruits of Voyaging. Arabic literature, be it pre-Islamic, Islamic, or still Islamic, has brought forth well-known examples of travel literature. Our specific text is, however, not sitting too well on this level, <coughs> And I propose, therefore, after paying some dues to the need for general information, to quickly run back to the particular Arabic word for voyaging mentioned. The text I would, would be dealing with was composed in the 13th century by Bukhidin ibn Arabi, who sometimes, for lack of a better name, has been called a theosophist, 
sometimes with better reasons, one of the greatest figures in Islamic spirituality, or just a Sheikh al Akbar, the greatest of masters. Whichever name is applied, there is no doubt that his writings are deeply informed by the classic Islamic sources of knowledge, namely the Quran and the Ahadith. Even if in the Arabic, Arabi reads these sources in ways that are often irritating to conventional Islamic theology and thus have led to sometimes quite violent controversy. At first glance, the relevance of voyaging for Ibn Arabi seems to be derived from its Shia universality. All beings that establish the religiously formulated cosmos that is all of creation, its creator himself, and the book that tells of both creator and creation are traveling. And all are traveling in so far as they are moving. This surprisingly physical understanding of voyaging appears, however soon in a different light when it becomes clear to which extent the differentiation amongst various kinds of traveling is not just a physical, but also, and even more so, a legal matter. The law in this case is, of course, the divine law, the Sharia. From this moment on, traveling is not just a matter of moving anymore, it becomes movement in respect of the divine. There are accordingly three major kinds of voyage, one of which receives particular attention here and is subdivided into three further groups. It is important to note already here that the voyages are envisaged in regard of the need of preparation for them. There is first, I quote, the voyage for which the servant should be prepared because it is required by the divine law, and in whose preparation his felicity, Sa'ada, lies, uh, that is the voyage to Allah, in him and from him. Second, the voyage whose preparation is not required by the divine law, that is, traversing the earth in the pursuit of illicit goal for the business of this world, quotation. And third, the voyage of his own breath, which is not a matter of the divine law, but of nature. As only the first kind of voyage is required by the divine law, and the felicity of the traveler depends on it, Ibn Arabi specifies the subdivisions, namely, firstly, voyage min indahu, voyage from him, of which there are again three subtypes, namely, first, the voyage of the one who is thrown out of divine presence, matrud, like Iblis, the devil. Secondly, the voyage of shame, Hajar, the voyage of sinners, that is, of those who are not outrightly rebuked, but cannot stay in the presence of Allah because of their shame. And thirdly, the voyage of those who went back, who are sent back by Allah to the world of creation, that is to say, the messengers and those who are sent by, by him to govern this world. Secondly, the voyage ilayhi, to him, which is firstly the voyage of the one who associates another divinity with Allah, that is to say shirk. Secondly, the voyage of the one who worships him as a transcendent God, Tanzir. And thirdly, the voyage of those who are protected against Arab Masul, that is to say the prophets and saints. Thirdly, the third kind of voyage is fihi, in him, and there are two subdivisions, one by a, by reflection and intellect, we are him, but him, and the travelers of these, their guide is their fiqh. These are the philosophers. Secondly, those who are, quote, are taken on the voyage by God, sufiru, sufiru, bihi, fihi, that is, the messengers, the Rusul, the Anbiya, the prophets, the voyagers amongst the, the saints, like the realized ones from the folk of Sufism. Al Musafiruna min al Awliya, al Muhaqiquna min Rijal Sufiya. Two things emerge from this description that the only voyage worthy to be considered and worthy to be cared for here is the voyage in regard of God. And the best or the safest way of traveling in regard of him 
is not by following one's own ideas or imaginations, that is, if one can say so, not even by traveling, but by allowing oneself to be traveled. Yet if such are the voyages of prophets and saints, which part does an ordinary traveler have in them? Or in other words, if all servants of Allah and then the law should devote themselves with all their means to the preparation of such a journey, then of what particular benefit will the voyages of prophets be for them? To search for an answer to this question, let us take a look at two prophets' prophetic voyages out of the many of the Hanabi recounts, the stories of the voyages of Sayyidina Ibrahim and Sayyidina Muhammad. But preceding this, I would like to quickly come back to the Arabic word for voyage used here, namely Safa. Regarding this word, in the Arabic begins in the, his text with an observation. The observation or an interpretation, or maybe just some wordplay, which nevertheless lies at the heart of the adapt of traveling. He observes that this Arabic word for voyaging, Safa, also means unveiling. Quote, the voyage was called Safa because it unveiled Yusfiru, the manner thereby making the blameworthy and the praiseworthy characteristics of every man and in sand that every man has appear. We have to rewrite our previous definition of voyaging accordingly. If we use the word Safa to speak of voyaging, then voyaging means movement which unveils. Movement that unveils. Thus, in a certain sense, all voyages, those undertaken in pursuit of some earthly business, the natural voyage of one's breath, and the voyages required by the divine law, included those of the rejection by God, or of the difficulty of remaining in his presence, all of them must be understood as voyages of unveiling. But the effects of the results at their age of these unveiling vary in correspondence with the one who travels and the one with those for whose sake the voyage is undertaken. To give the most general and therefore the most imprecise answer to the question of what is unveiled in any voyage, one could say, myself. In this sense, the one who travels would be me, Anna, and all the voyages would be undertaken for my own sake. Why is then one particular kind of voyage, that is to say, the voyage to God in him and from him, required? And why does happiness consist or is found only in it? Well, precisely, I don't know, I am told so. It seems then that listening and understanding accompany my voyage, or maybe our voyages themselves. If the Arabi speaks in his text not only of the voyages of persons, prophetic or divine, but also of the voyages of words, or of the recital of the Holy Quran, and thereby of listening to, reciting, and interpreting what is said, each of these should be understood as movements of unveiling, as quite likely it should in the Arabi's book be seen as it said, quote, I only speak of all the voyages mentioned here, aiming at my own essence and not as, as an interpretation tafsir of the story that happened to these prophets. These voyages are bridges and passageways built so that we pass over them, Naburo Adeha, towards our essences and our own states. We profit from them because Allah made them for us a place of passage, Mahabaran Lana. If interpretation means finding one's way from letters to meaning, then the meaning in this case is not located in the stories, but in the teller or the hearer or reader. The travel stories of the prophets are not told for their own sake to inform or to entertain or become objects of research, but precisely they are told as ways to travel. They prepare the tellers of their tales as well as the heroes for their own voyages, providing places to pass. Let us take a look at two of them, the story of one of the voyages of Abraham, 
that the story of the voyage of the Prophet Muhammad. Following the indication of the Quran, Inna dahibun illa rabbi sayahdini, I am going to my Lord, he will guide me. In the, in the army calls this voyage, quote, the voyage of guidance. It is in brief and according to common view, the story of Abraham's sacrifice of his son Ishmael. In the army's reading of it, that is his traveling aid, has however a different result, one that makes it in a way a voyage of voyaging, or if you like, the story of travel stories. Quote, this station, Manzil, is difficult because it is a place of passage, Mahava. It is not thought for its own sake, but for that which should be accomplished through it. In other words, it is a story of interpretation. One calls the, quote, one calls the interpretation of dreams or of visions, Tabir al passing, Aybara, because the interpretation Tabir passes from the dream to that which it came for, unquote. Ibn Arabi mentions in this context what he calls, quote, the prophet's passing from milk to knowledge, unquote, as su a su successful passing and contrasts it with Abraham's voice, which, quote, threw him into the darkness that prevented him from crossing this passage, unquote. There seems then to be interpretation and interpretation. Interpretation that arrives at what the vision came for, an interpretation that gets, so to speak, stuck on the bridge. That is the interpretation held by the image. The reason for this being held in passage lies already in the blindness of attention. By asking God, Rabbi Habli min Asalikin, Abraham asked Allah to give him a child for the righteous. Abraham asked God for other than God, according to Ibn Arabi. He asked God for other than God. If the intention of the voyage is nevertheless to go to God, then the traveler must go blind, or blindly, in other words. He or she must travel in the universe of pleasure and pain, joy and sadness, where, <coughs> as in the case of Abraham, he experiences extreme joy at the moment of being relieved from the pain of having to kill his son. This, however, is due to Abraham's not seeing that his son signified Ram from the very beginning. If he had not asked Allah for other than him, then he would, as Ibn Arabi puts it, quote, receive as good news a contemplation and Mushahada and not Isaac. This, the story of the voyage of Abraham is for this reason not less significant and valuable. For although, as it is told here, it is not the story of an arrival, nor the story of a successful interpretation, nor the story of somebody who made it, but rather the story of somebody who is caught in transit. It is only through it and precisely, precisely through it that we come to know of guidance. In this sense, it serves as much as all the other stories of the voyages of prophets as a bridge for, towards our essences and states. Next to Abraham, the second traveler, or rather band of travelers who are traveling with hindrances must be mentioned, namely the philosophers. Abraham's wish for a worldly good was still addressed to God and therefore acknowledged him as a guide to himself. I am going to God, and he will guide me. The second going was, however, for not follow divine guidance, but his guidance of their own reflection and intellect. In the army calls them the philosophers. So I must kind of cut In the Arabic way of interpreting from the philosophers, then one can do so by calling it a kind of literalism. If the Arabic is not at all against interpreting such descriptions, but he insists on the importance 
for the fact that Allah Himself described Himself in this way, and that therefore this letter, out the outward sense, cannot be brushed aside or left behind for the sake of the real meaning, that's to say the inward sense. Yes, the outward sense needs interpretation, but it consists in respecting it as it is, and to travel with it, to take it to the inward sense. To accomplish such a passage that the interpreter must take the outward sense with him or her, they must travel really with the outward sense and not go fault with crossing. The inward sense will in this way only be known when they arrive by either wasana or wajada, when arriving one finds. In this case, a kind of traveling it should rather be called halting with traveling. The resulting statement of interpretation could perhaps be formulaically translated as. This outward sense means that. Imran recalls this Aivara, giving expression, but in the sense of traveling with traveling, or crossing with crossing, the inward sense is the outward sense, only unveiled. Quote, as for the faithful, the truthful, the possessors of steadfastness amongst the friends of Allah, they cross over, taking the outward sense along with them. They do not cross from the outward sense to the inward sense, but they take the letter itself to the meaning without giving expression of it. Yeah. yeah, I would have to say something about travel also. Why do you give me another five minutes? We should have a discussion. All right. Okay. It is noteworthy. I would like to mention to you from Ibn Arabi's account of the night journey, that this is a, something about <coughs> the Prophet of Isra and the Art of the Prophet Muhammad. I'd like to mention to you from Ibn Arabi's account of the night journey three points which are closely connected servitude, love, and what is called the Musamarat, the nightly conversation. The one who travels, or rather is traveled, Sufiru, in this voyage is called not Muhammad, not the Prophet Muhammad. This refers to the uh, area in the Quran, Subhanallah, Asra bi Abdihi Laylan. He is not called Muhammad, not Prophet Muhammad, but his servant, Abdu. There is no one who says, I am going, not even I am going to my Lord, as uh, Ibrahim was said. said or I travel, I am crossing the bridge, I arrive. In the Arabi describes this servitude as unqualified servitude. The servitude of Prophet Muhammad. Quote, free of all the lordly and divine quality, or the absence of absence, I am alive, when the servant is so completely servant that he is even absent from servitude. And it is the servant who has shown God signs on the horizon and in himself and has given the most complete knowledge. He is passing from prostration to prostration, sajda from sajda to sajda, as he does not halt with unveiling, nor is he held by it. His servant is taken to travel by night and into the night. His voyage is as much a voyage of spaces as it is of times and of the human being. Quote, the night is three thirds, and the human being is three worlds. The world of sensation, which is the first third of the night, the world of imagination, which is the second, and the world of meaning, which is the last third of the night in this configuration. Within the last, the real descends, as indicated by its words, quote, the heart of my servant embraces me. If words were spoken in the intimacy of the night, what would be revealed of them and of their meaning? In this conversation, who speaks with whom? Lover with beloved, servant with Lord, me with whom? Let us not forget that each word of the Quran is said to be open towards all meanings demanded by speech. Whoever recites, whoever listens, whoever interprets, whoever travels, are they not in search for their meaning? Are not then all kinds of voyages, prophetic and philosophic and otherwise, all those arrivals and possibilities to arrive, are there not in so many words only two words 
Aina Ana, and me, where am I? As for the Musamarat, the nocturnal conversation in Arabic says, it is I, he says, who recite the book for him with his tongue while he listens to me. And that is my nocturnal conversation with him. That servant savors my word, but if he binds himself to his own meanings, he leaves me by his reflection and meditation. What he must do is only lean towards me and leave his ears receptive to my word until I am present in his recitation. And just as it is I who recite and I who make him hear, it is also I who then explain my word to him and interpret his meaning. That is my nocturnal conversation. Thank you very much. Sorry, I had to run. Well, sorry, we had to rush you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. I saw the uh, questions open the door. Any comments, questions? Yes. I wonder whether Ibn Arabi said anything concerning uh, Abraham's wife, Hajar's voice, uh, sorry, uh, voyage, or a type of voyage, her anxious walk between Asafel and Marwa, and then which is a type of spatial movement, probably we can call it also a voyage, and recuperated now in the uh, ritual uh, in uh, Hajj. And then, uh, with a hedge itself, uh, a type of a voyage. Yeah. So I wonder whether there is anything concerning hedges. Yeah, it's not in this text, not in this book. Okay. But I mean, there are many, many other voyages mentioned there, but uh, hard to do, but not this particular subject. I mean, the story of Ibrahim, says, Ibrahim, on your first in respect, in order to show a certain kind of travel that we just described here. That Halting with travel, the travel of guidance. Yes? Thank you very much for that. Oh, that uh, really wonderful paper. I have a small question about the Ibn Arabi's approach. Um, if the journey is to be interpreted, and the interpretation of the journey is also a type of spiritual journey unveil the meaning of the original journey. So we have uh, almost two parallel journeys going on, going on. And at the end of both journeys, we have do we, how does one as a spiritual journey person know that they have arrived at, at the meaning of the original journey that one is paralleling. Is there any um, uh, apparatus in uh, Ibn Arabi's process of interpretation that allows one to confirm or verify that the end goal of that journey of unveiling uh, has been confirmed? Yeah, well, in a certain way, your question already is part of the answer. Namely, who is there to know if he or she has arrived? Because the voyage itself is, is the voyage of myself, the, and uh, the voyage of the Prophet Muhammad is the best example for it. Then, like we said, it's the servant who is even absent from the servanthood. That means who is not aware of being a servant. He's so completely serving that he does not distinguish himself or is distinguished from his servitude, then who, who would be there and how would we, who would know that he or she has arrived? That's why I find this also the quotation by Masala Vajada, which is so interesting here, namely, if you arrive, if there is arrival, then what is found? So I, there can't be, negatively speaking, there can't be so the so-called objective criterion for having arrived. But the the, the, the the practice is important, the practice of this, what we, we call spiritual interpretation. So, so one knows that one's arrived when 
one arrives. No, when you arrive, you're not there. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> I mean, it's difficult for us because uh, we are uh, used to our subjective objective dichotomy. And that we have something in front of him we can look at and can measure and so on. But that is very strange in regard to spiritual practice. Now, I found it particularly interesting also. If I may add this, after we heard a little bit about oral history, this is not, on one hand, it seems to be all tied to written text. But then on the other hand, what is the Quran? Is the Quran a written text or an oral text? I and mean, we know that there are discussions about it. The Quran certainly has a particular quality in respect of these things. And it's not sufficiently worked on, has been worked on. But uh, in terms of the talk we heard yesterday at the museum about oral history, I found it particularly interesting to take such things into, a, into the account, like what she said about, what's her name? Fatma. What she said about the way people, her sources responded to those who asked them. I mean, this is a very important thing. Then I call it here at one point the adab of traveling. I mean, for instance, the story of uh, uh, being tra traveled or being made to travel by a spiritual guide is very similar to it. So because this voyage brings out your, your bad characteristics, because it's difficult. So uh, that was mentioned by an Arab here also. And uh, so I think that although it sounds on one hand pretty abstract, maybe one might say, but these things are all verified or practiced in the daily spiritual practices. I mean, you know, if you found ever a spiritual master of putting you together with somebody in one hotel room that you don't particularly like and on your voyage, then you will find out what the purpose of this is. So you talk to that. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if I was second. Our second presentation is Professor Piazzi Pavlik Lasala. She's a postdoctoral research and teaching associate at the Institute of Philosophy and Collaborative Research Centre 980 at Free University of Berlin. She completed her PhD in philosophy at the uh, Laser Institute in uh, 2010. Her research interests include medieval and modern philosophy, Arabic philosophy, epistemology, and metaphysics. And the presentation today is on inner and outer troubles in Al-Hazal. Thank you very much. So, yes, the title is Inner and Outer Troubles in Al-Ghazali. Um, Al-Ghazali's famous criticism of the peripatetic tradition and the Arabic philosopher, including Ibn Sina, is best seen in his Tarakut al as well as is well known. In the course of his argumentation, he asserts that he wants to take an anti-philosophical or better non-philosophical standpoint according to his understanding of philosophy. He explicitly takes issue with certain philosophical convictions of the philosopher. Although Al-Ghazali is considered a critic of this tradition, he follows in its footsteps in his psychological and epistemological approaches. Thus, it is hardly surprising that his definition of the parts of the soul and his description of the epistemic process has something in common with the approach of Al-Farabi and most of all Ibn Sina. It has often been pointed out that it is true for the psychological and epistemological concepts in Al-Ghazali's works, Mokaz al falesifa the half of al falesifa and Hizan al amal which were written before he left his academic post in Baghdad around the year um, 1095. The most important and probably still most uh, widely read book of Al Ghazali's middle period, the years of traveling after he left Baghdad and before he started to teach again in Shapur, is the Ihya Ulumuddin. It also contains a psychological and epistemological approach that is to a great extent in line with the argumentation of the mentioned earlier works. One of the books of Al Ghazali's famous Ihya bears the title Kitab Adab Safa. In this work, 
And he does not only discuss the desirable forms of travel behavior, and describes the increase and advancement of knowledge by traveling, but also interweaves these descriptions with discussion of the inner intellectual journey and the development of knowledge and the elevation of insight in human beings. And he thus unfolds here an advanced psychological and epistemological theory. So, um, as already mentioned above, Alvarez's work, If Your Room with Dean, was composed after he left his academy post in Baghdad, probably in the years 1096 to 1098. The Kitab Adab Safar is the seventh book of the second part. On the one hand, this book has to be understood in the framework of Muslim travel literature of Alvarez's lifetime. So the importance of travel in this period, as, um, as well as for his own intellectual endeavors, evident in the fact that he wrote one entire book of the Ikhya to this theme. His most decisive deliberations of inner and outer forms of travel are to be found in the first chapter of this book. But already in the prologue, Al-Ghazali uh, clearly differentiates between inner and outer forms of traveling. He formulates this as follows, quote, Now then, travel is a means for escape from what is flat for, for attaining what is sought and desired. Travel has two forms. There's the travel of the physical body, out from the habitation and home into deserts and open spaces. And there's the travel of the heart's journey, out from the lows of the low up to the dominion of the heavens. The noble of the two is the inward travel. Thus, also, the epistemological process of an inner development towards and final achievement of divine knowledge is clearly described in the terminology of traveling. <coughs> in what follows, al Ghazali invites readers to critical reflection and rational inquiry. This topos is repeatedly promoted in his accounts. At the same time, he makes clear that the formation of the, of the, of the capacity for critical reflection relies upon proper instruction and learning, as well as the appropriate company. According to his explanations, only few people are actually capable to undertake this inner travel properly, or the greater majority of people is unattainable. However, all those without direct access to inner travel may benefit from narrowly defined forms of worldly physical traveling, since also this form of traveling can contribute to an increase in knowledge. Besides the aspiration of knowledge, he also acknowledges another legitimate motivation for the undertaking of travel of the physical body, namely flight from harmful conditions. As harmful, classify here diseases as much as persecution or conditions that may render proper religious life impossible. Al Ghazali differentiates in chapter one between three classes of knowledge to be gained by physical travel, of which at least two may classify as classical forms of knowledge. He names and discusses religious knowledge in the form of the knowledge of one of the religious sciences, self-knowledge, and knowledge of nature. Whereas the latter is defined as a form of understanding divine science in the world by way of analogy. The latter can be understood by also taking his interpretation of the concept of the preserved tablet into account as it is developed in other parts of the area. And I come to that. For al Ghazali, self-knowledge must comprise the awareness of one's inner capacities and failures. Travel is supposed to contribute to self-knowledge, since it achieves those negative characteristics of persons that might not have come to the fore in the same surroundings one so much before the same. He writes, quote, In summary, the soul at home in the company of pleasant occasions will not display its evil character traits because it has settled into the familiar comforts with which suits its nature. When the soul endures travel's hardship, and is kept from its accustomed comforts, and samples the hardships of life away from home, its evils are laid bare, and its faults are suddenly recognized. Then it is possible to attend to its cure. What forms this cure of the soul is not mentioned here by al Ghazali, but it may be understood from other books of the Inhia, especially from his deliberations in Ajayim and Khan. Moments of the heart. Even though the merits of hardships of traveling for self knowledge have been underlined here at the later stage of the same chapter, the advantages of traveling are confined to narrowly limited periods of time. Permanent traveling, instead, is supposed to result in a complete confusion of the heart. Thus, especially for weaker characters, 
traveling can turn out to be an inherently risky and dangerous undertaking for their moral and intellectual capacity. However, even for stronger characters, inward traveling is to be preferred over actual physical. <coughs> Therefore, as Hazel writes, comes another quote, now the business of dismounting and setting off is something that confuses all the inward states. Thus, the aspirant ought only to travel in order to search for knowledge or to see a master scholar whose conduct he will imitate, from whose side he will to, um, <clears throat> the will to do good will benefit. But if he busies himself and seeks to see clearly, and when the way of reflection or works is opened up to him, then staying in residence is better suited for him. The fact that al appears to favor inward over outward traveling becomes also evident in focusing on his deliberations about the knowledge of nature to be obtained by physical traveling. In this context, he underlines that the observation of nature has to go beyond sense perception, beyond mere outer seeing and hearing. Instead, the ideal is to reach a stage of inward seeing and hearing that gives access to divine knowledge. But therefore, so long as the traveler needs to see the world of dominion and of witnessing with physical sight, he is far behind in the first stage of the stages of those who sojourn towards God and travel to his majesty. It is as if he has clung to the doorway and has not proceeded. Thus, the true knowledge seeker is in the end the one who focuses on inward travel. We have to know that. that. What need has he for coming and going in open spaces when there is song for him in the dominion of the heavens? The sun, the moon, and the stars are then subject in their coming and going to his command. In the sight of those who possess insight, these travel continuously, these travel continuously in each month and year, while still moving tirelessly through the course of time. So once, consequently, the inward travel is the undertaking of a permanent lifelong journey, in contrast with the outward travels that ought to be undertaken only for limited periods. The properly undertaken inward travel also appears to make the need for outer traveling, at least from the perspective of a possible <coughs> increase of knowledge, in the end obsolete. What the inner travel comprises can be best be understood from Al-Razeli's Ajeb al Kalb and I shall come to this now. So the first book of the third part of the Ihya um, is the Ajeb al Kalb. <clears throat> it contains a detailed reflection of what is taken to be al Ghazali's psychology. The discussion is closely connected to his interpretation of the concept of the preserved tablet. On the one hand, al Ghazali discusses preserved tablet in a view to the divine creation of the world. On the other hand, he sheds light on its accessibility to human knowledge, describing the possibilities of indirect central access to its worldly image or of direct rational access. In this work, the human heart is already indicated by the titles at the center of the discussion. While Razali, the word heart has two meanings here. <coughs> on the one hand, it refers to the physical animal or human heart. On the other, the word denotes a spiritual intellectual substance. Uh, this subtle, tenuous substance is the real essence of man, and the heart is the part of man which perceives and knows and experiences. Other interchangeable terms for the heart as spirit, soul, and um, uh, also the intellect. According to Al Ghazali, the heart is where actual human knowledge is possible. Um, similarly to an Epistemian and also Aristotelian approach, she further differentiates knowledge um, into two. Um, he differentiates between two kinds of knowledge, which are knowledge of the sensibles and knowledge of the Accordingly, there are two fundamental ways in which knowledge can reach the heart. And this is one via the perception of the material sense of the world, and via divine revelation, and divine inspiration. The perception of the sensible takes place with the help of um, external senses and five inner senses. For Al-Razali, these inner senses include the common sense, the retentive in imagination, reflection, recollection, and storage and then rearing. And above that level, then there comes rationality, and above rationality comes intuition. <laughs> the functioning of the inner senses is described as a process in which human beings, after sensing an object with the external sense of sight, perceive the image or form of it within their imagination. Um, 
By means of an uh, illustrative metaphor, Al-Ghazali describes in chapter 9 the divine creation of the world as arriving on an archetype on the preserved tablet. The description of the real nature of things is not only laid out in this tablet, but, he created, uh, but the created world is the image of the archetype. Human beings have two fundamental ways of accessing and thus understanding the preserved tablet. The first and most obvious way is through sense perception. And that's the same thing that one can do while traveling, right? Gaining insight into the nature of the world. Um, <clears throat> human beings perceive an image of the material created world, which is itself an image of the health of the external and internal senses. Al-Ghazali formulates this in the following way. From the world which has been brought into actuality in the image of the archetype, that is transmitted to the external senses and the retentive imagination is still another image. Interestingly, the things of the world transmit an image to the senses and the imagination here. Humans do not access the world with orally existing mental concepts, but the image of the material world comes into the imagination. According to Al-Ghazali, the image available in the human imagination corresponds to the external material world. Then, the imagination transmits an effect to the heart, but is subject to intellectual reflection. As a result, the actual nature of this thing is supposed to be unraveled. Accordingly, the image that enters the human heart should correspond to the image of the imagination that corresponds to the external world, which, moreover, is an image of the divine plan. Um, in this way, it is possible to understand the divine realm by understanding the material world by a sense perception of the imagination. In this discussion, all inner senses and activities are subsumed under the term imagination. Al-Ghazali also talks in this context of the world <coughs> four different forms of existence, namely one, the preserved tablet, two, um, the world as corporeal or real existence, three, as an imaginative existence, and four, as an intellectual existence. Besides the material existence of the world, all other forms of existence are spiritual, which differ in the degree of spirituality. However, since this is a mediated way of understanding the divine world, namely through the central and the imaginative world, these forms of existence also reflect obstacles for understanding. In essence, they constitute a veil between the divine world and the intellectual understanding of the heart. Here, the above mentioned second way of understanding the preserved tablet comes into play, since it is the direct access of the heart to the divine realm can only take place in forms of dream visions when the sense perception is not active. And these are the same kind of things that I believe are in the part of travels are called in the travel. Um, these dream visions are only available to somebody who, quote, devotes himself exclusively to the remembrance of Allah, and are revealed to him through general inspiration and uh, accounting into his heart from whence he knows not. This form of knowledge is more direct and requires the heart's moral pur purification. Nevertheless, from the example that al Azal uses to clarify his deliberations, it is possible to infer that the most desirable form of knowledge is a combination of both forms of understanding. He exemplifies this by using the famous mirror metaphor. Thus, the purification and clarification of the heart undertaken by the saints is only reasonable and can only lead to deeper insights if the other side of intellectual understanding, which is based on the perceptions of the material and imaginative world, is not reflected. This, in turn, is due to the fact that the heart is bevering between the visible and the invisible world. Thus, the intellectual process on the basis of the perception of the senses and the imagination remains a critical step in the process of understanding the essence of things. This understanding of it, um, the essence of things in the human heart is never completely identical with the archetype plan of the preserved tablet, even if people have great visions. In Al Ghazali's account, this absolute knowledge remains reserved for angels because the real nature of things are written down in the preserved tablet and indeed in the heart of the angels. Thus, in a general concept, Ghazali maintains the peripatetic epistemology of Ibn Sina with regard to the mention of inner senses to a great extent. Only the sense of estimation gets dismissed. However, 
the explanation of the concrete functioning of the different you know, senses remains obscure. Furthermore, although al Razali emphasizes the importance of the purification and clarification of the heart's intellectual activity, remains highly important. Um, both taken together appear to constitute, I believe, the desired form of inner traveling that al Razali has laid out shortly in the Kitab al Thanks, Bertrand, for this very interesting presentation. I don't get Al-Razali's concept to right. Uh, if the heart is a place where perceptions somehow get, get uh, collected, as the words are called, or thought about or used or whatever. But sensual perception is one of the two ways to acquire knowledge. So it is. Do, do I have to imagine if I go and travel and see something and touch something that these sense, sense of perceptions immediately go to my heart where they are processed to knowledge or uh, well, they first they, they know they, they first undergo what, what is called inner senses. So they first undergo that is which lies under the um, the major terminology of imagination, which has sub senses. And this is a kind of calls it in other books kind of filtering or a kind of I'm missing the right terminology now, but um, it passes the imagination, and there, like the form that is received from the outer center, and this is clearly Aristotelian terminology, I believe, or which comes via a different um, These forms then um, remain in the imagination and are reflected upon another time before the reach what we will call rationality. Also, sometimes calls it akhl, but then he also uses the term heart. So, um, what we would in general only call rationality that is, has its place in the heart. Um, Wait, so, how does imagination, I mean, for where bodily. Where is it? Yeah, yeah where that's is right. Where um, does they, imagination come in in this we way? Have, we have other accounts where he tries also to answer that question because it's a question for, not only for him, it has also been a question for Al Farabi and Ibn Sina. And um, he avoids it. Oh. It is not really clear if it's in the brain or in the heart. And um, I would argue, and if I believe that he goes along with Ibn Sina, I would say he tries to, to go along the same lines with Ibn Sina. And Ibn Sina at some point says it's not important. It appears to be maybe um, in the brain, but the real rationality is in the heart, but it doesn't really matter. And I believe it has to do with the fact that um, there are two kinds of of uh, philosophic tradition in the background, which is Galen for one thing, and on the other hand, Aristotle, which comes together with the fact that in the holy text also not, uh, development of knowledge takes place in the heart. But also when you come from, from the philosophical traditions of Aristotle and Galen, you have the two possibilities of either brain um, or, or heart. And that is mixed up here. And there is no, no clear differentiation. And I think because Imagination is described as a pathway. It's not the major importance. So the major interesting for him, as for um, also for the philosopher, um, the more important capacity is the rationality, and then afterwards comes what is intuition, or it comes um, decided, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Well, Logical projections one can see by heart, and here again the word can see is the uh, soul. So here is a bit the intuitive question is that if you come back to the Ishanti perception of the two things, oh. I think it won't be possible to project it in as confined to the senses of body senses of body senses. Because what are the bodily senses is sort of refinement of the body senses also. Uh, regarding to your Sufi uh, intuition, I think it is something beyond but this is what, and even mm -hmm. outside of validity. 
But, but this is why I said um, um, that is also the same why, why I mentioned this famous mirror metaphor that you might have heard of. It's not merely stupidism, it's not merely saints. And he clearly says that, he has that, maybe I described the metaphor just for, for the sake of um, clarifying that more. He has that idea, he says, um, there are two different people were taken and they were supposed um, to draw a wonderful painting. And they do that at two, two opposite walls. There's a curtain in between while they're working. One people is doing a very wonderfully colorful drawing. The other ones are only polishing the wall. They're not doing anything else. They're polishing the wall. And then the curtain is lifted. And then the picture on the side of, of the um, polished wall is more colorful and more beautiful than the other one which has been painted in wonderful colors. And then comes the conclusion of that. He says, you need both things. You need the colorful side, plus you need the purification of yourself, like in the mirror, because then your heart works as a mirror. Then he says, being only a saint is not enough. What you need is rational reflection. And rational reflection depends upon reflecting on what has become has come to you from um, from the external world. And this is why I said. He would say, or, or he says, the ideal is, at a certain point, to get away from sense perception, right? And only to rely on the inner reflection. But this, I mean, this is an, an old philosophical topic. But being a human being, and being exposed to sense perception, in the end, you cannot get away with it. So, so here again, what, what becomes the almagrundic no, there are, there are two different kinds. I mean, there's only, for one thing, there is the reflection upon this, what has um, come inside from the senses, yeah, and this is then more rationalized. And then there are some people who also receive from, uh, from the divine realm um, insights. And those are then put together. And then there are some kinds of increase of knowledge. But you cannot have either one. So, Having either one of the sides will never lead you to what is his idea of um, um, complete knowledge in the end. Or well, this is at least my reading of it. Yes. Uh, but what is the difference uh, between just going around town and traveling? So uh, in, in this perception, it's uh, not a matter. Even if you go outside of your house, it's a problem. And then, then comes the point where there's a difference between Aristotle and this, because Aristotle uh, always sees public duty. And uh, you have to do something for your community, etc. How does he, does he deal uh, with this? Because in Islam, it's all, uh, also uh, uh, high duty. Let me I, I answer that in, in two steps. For one thing, um, travel is more dangerous because it exposes you to more dangers. And it's not the same as go as leaving um, your house. Because those are surroundings that you are known, to, uh, that, that, are, that you are familiar with. Yeah. Um, but um, leaving your house and exposing yourself to um, travels to all places that are further away exposes you to dangers. And to deal with these dangers, this is what he describes as is um, dangerous to your morality, because then you are in situations that you are not accustomed to, and you might react in a way that you do not want, because then you, you might react in an immoral way. So this is why this is there's the difference. That's the other thing. We in those texts there is no um, no response to that, because what what about public duty? What about so you are referring to something like. The Nicomachean ethics, for example, yeah, in those texts, not. Like when when you look here and when you compare these two, so when it comes to traveling, there's um, no discussion of this matter. Uh, in a mere addition, so it is not about a, a daily habits. If you're a merchant or something like this, 
this doesn't tell you uh, as well uh, as much as uh, if it's a one in a lifetime uh, travel experience or uh, you, you do it once a year or something. Uh, so it's very well, much I think, the, mm, I think the, uh, the question is also, I mean, he does not say, but I would um, um, assume it, that it depends on the intentions that you have. Yeah, it's important what kind of intentions are behind it. Yeah. And this kind of what, what you, you, the question that you are asking, he doesn't even discuss it being a merchant. Okay. Because his idea is only gain knowledge about the world. And gain knowledge about the world is uh, gain knowledge about the nature, about the, the natural. And so being a merchant, and it's no gain of knowledge. So he doesn't yeah, even sure. discuss this, this idea. Oh. And in this book, he, he speaks about uh, travel as a travel pronoun. Castle is saying being to a more moral pronoun is saying being. And he says, in order to be able to travel, it's like about the travel of the soul. And you have to be able to detach yourself from all your material uh, relationships, from everything that ties you down. You have to be able to be with it. So being a merchant is not the same thing. It's like, for example, like, uh, not to settle in one place so you don't get affiliated with the place or like you don't develop a relationship or uh, become like say a material or something you have to be able to leave this all this behind and to, just to be in, in a travel in search of um, knowledge and like uh, yeah, that will, will take you to a different state of morality and like purification of the soul I think this is it. Mm -hmm. But I think your question was more about that. What would I describe under that term of outer travel? Is why, why outer travel is leading to some? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, not the psychology between the eye and the heart. Um, so how does the filtering work? Gasset, and he's very much in line with like this contemporary related big ideas. And the eye is potentially evil. I think it was like bad information, but the heart for Gasset just knows what is right mm -hmm. and what is wrong. Probably the it's not so clear, but probably the Falesica tradition um, they uh, did not read Augustine. It's um, it's coming over translations really from um, Aristotle the uh, Aristotle's the anima. And um, what this is why that would also corresponds to Jens' question. Um, the filtering is done what is called imagination. The evil as such, uh, the, sorry, the eye as such is not evil. This is our only sense perception. But the problem um, happens in that kind of um, filtering moment. It has to undergo that process to all that comes inside from uh, from your senses has to pass imagination to reach. Um, the rational part of the heart, but that can happen at practice because what um, one thing like um, the image as such can be um, it can arrive in the imagination already falsely. Plus, imagination has also the um, uh, the imagination also has to. Um, to help you memorizing. So memory falls also under the terminology of, um, of imagination. So um, what <coughs> happens then in uh, while you memorize, while you, when, while you recall what was is, what is in your memory of the things you have seen? You're putting together um, the term for for the things you have seen with the things actually with the with the actual forms. And already in this process, there can um, pop up problems. So the eye as such is not evil, it's not the problem, but um, uh, the problem takes place in the passage from, from the eye to the heart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, um, our third presentation today is um, by uh, Louise Gavorini. She's a PhD candidate in the Arabic and the Eastern Language Department of the American University of Beirut. And 
Lebanon. Um, after an MA in on modern Arabic literature at the INAMCO in Paris, <coughs> focusing on contemporary Arabic literature from Lebanon and the Arabian Peninsula, she now returned to classical Arabic and Islamic literature. The dissertation topic is Angels in Sufism, the Quran, Naraj literature, and the works of Ibn Arabi. Uh, his presentation today is on traveling through the heavens, the Naraj of Abu Yazid al Mustami, as an example of early Sufi Naraj literature and its significance. Thank you. Thank you to Ali Ismail. There's so much happening here. Okay. Oh, yes. So, <clears throat> the literature is an aspect of Islamic eschatological literature that has been built upon a few verses of the Quran pertaining to what came to be known as the night journey of Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem, which is the Isra. And his heavenly has ascension, which is the Mi'raj proper. Isra in Arabic is rather clear in its meaning of night travel, as is the Quranic verse associated with it in Surah al However, the Mi'raj, a word whose meaning is prayers or other, and has come to designate the heavenly ascension through the heavens to God, is linked most notably to Quranic verses that are more elusive in their meaning in Surah al -Najim. So if the night journey is alluded to in the Quran, the reference to the Mi'raj story is less clear, and will be found in the Hadith and the Sirah in further detail. Some accounts speak of stairs, and others of Burak, the legendary mount of the Prophet, that frequented the stairs. This is how the Mi'raj stories would progressively be elaborated and extended in religious literature until it could be said that it became a literary genre in itself, according to Roberto Tortori. With an elaboration in religious figures such as prophets and angels. The Akash literature took then a particular importance in Sufi literature, and this is what this presentation is about, to quote Gerard de Vering. For the Sufis, the night journey and ascension of the prophet became the prototype of the soul's itinerary to God, and it rises from the bounds of sensuality to the height of mystical knowledge. It is this travel as quest for mystical knowledge, reflecting the women habits on the travel for the quest of knowledge, that we will explore with an early example of Sufi literature, which is the Kitab al Nahraj attributed to Abu Yazid al Bistami, also known as Bayazid al Bistami. He is an important early Sufi figure, he is from what is now, now North Central Iran, <coughs> and he is interestingly known only by works and songs <coughs> attributed to him as he became an important reference for later Sufis, that there is no existing work directly authored by him. The text he used here is based on Renan Nicholson's edition of a manuscript whose author is uncertain. <coughs> it is one of different accounts of one distant Mi'raj, the longest one and the only one following the classic structure of the Mi'raj form from one heaven to another up to God. This particular retelling of a Mi'raj accomplished by Sufi personality, like in the accounts around him, is possibly one of the earliest Sufi works on the Mi'raj scene, paving the way for several subsequent ascension stories authored by or attributed to different Sufi personalities. Regarding the point of view of another important Sufi personality on the Prophet's Mi'raj, al Khoshayri discusses in his own book, Kitab al Mi'raj, the degrees of belief in the heavenly ascension, from those who refute it on one hand, and those who believe that the Prophet ascended both in body and spirit on the other hand, which is al Qoshayri's position. He then explains that the Sufi Mi'raj, such as al Bistami, differs from the Prophet's in that it is done only in spirit and not in body. This is supported by the vocabulary in the text, while the narrator uses the word noun, and ru'ya, or ra'etu, to describe his visions. So this true vision, Ruya, would be seen during his sleep in spirit and not in body. On Sufi dreams, every calendar tells us, and I quote, first dreams and dreaming were seen to serve an epistemic function, namely communicating knowledge naturally readily available otherwise. 
Second, dreams and dreamings were seen to serve a practical purpose, namely as an experiential element of wayfaring on the mystical path. Finally, dreams were made to serve as a marker of claims to status and authority, in particular in relation to the assertion that among all the self-identified tawarif comprising the Muslim body politic, it is the Sufis who fulfill the function of post-prophetic hairship for the Ummah itself. We will see that we can find at least one hit, one kind of such an elitist-like position, vision in the text itself. So we will quickly look into the story itself, with its characters, narratives, and symbolic implications, then from this rendering of the Sufi, Sufi master's ascension in unity to the prophetic ascension. The story is presented as narrated by a certain Abu Qasim al-Arif, relating what Abu Sami told him. Abu Sami travels to the seven heavens, up to the seat, al kursi then to the throne, al Arsh, where he finally meets God. At every heaven, he meets angels of different kinds and groups, and some of them are human names. Each time, they invite Abu Sami to share in their activities, such as praying, or offering unspecified but seemingly endless possessions. Thus, angels sound like they are complimenting him on arriving at such a level, that is one of the heavens, while tempting him in staying there and not going further. Every time Abu Sami understands that it is only a test, and he states that he wants to go further. Every time, and first he is taken to the first heaven by a dream bird, then to the second and third by a vision, and between the third and seventh heaven, it is an angel who is taking him by the hand to accompany him further. After the seventh sky, al is given wings so that he doesn't need any angelic help anymore to perform him to the seat, where the angel dedicated to it will also test him. However, al keeps on flying to the throne where other angels are pre present, such as the Kharubidin, which I believe in English is Cherubin, testing him again. <clears throat> However, al keeps his intent and finally got calls to him and draws him near, nearer than the soul to the body. The text ends with a part on the veracity of the event, which essentially argues that it is useless to try to convince people who don't believe in it in the first place. Arguments supported with prophetic sayings and chronicles. Regarding the form, the narrative is rather simple in its language compared to the other accounts about the Islamic. And the formulas at the beginning, Qada Abu Qasim al Arif, in the fashion of the Islam in the Hadith, suggests a normal transmission, or at least wants to present the text as such. Moreover, the oral, oral formulaic analysis comes to mind when reading this text. From the oral literary theory, first developed by Nijman Tari and Albert Lord on the Iliad and Odyssey epics, and then applied by Andrew Bannister on the Quran text. This analysis tool is used to evaluate how and to which degree a text is rooted in oral performance before being written down. According to this theory, recitals use a set of formulas and themes to help them memorize long narratives. These formulas, whether single and repeated word for word or in systems of very similar ones, are repeated throughout the narration and possibly rearranged according to the recital situation during the performance. This supposes that the narrative were then not as fixed in its words as the written text obtained from it afterward. With this in mind, even a quick reading of this Mihra story marks it as clearly orally based, as we find the repetition of several sentences and phrases in similar places at each stage of the narrative. For example, we have the following sentence. My goal is different from what you are offering me. Muradi fi Which is repeated nine times, and this at the end of each heavenly visit. We also have the sentence, in all of this I understood that he was testing me. Or the author of endless possessions, which is repeated in slightly different forms. For example, in the seventh sky, and when he arrives at the throne. 
Regarding the content, we find common themes and characters of prophetic Dutch stories, though with some notable differences. For example, a Bissami meets with the prophets after the God and before, with a special emphasis on Prophet Muhammad, the only one mentioned by name. Brook Bukovic showed in her study of prophetic Mi'ambash narratives that the prophets meeting with different prophets, such as Moses or Jesus, served for legitimacy purposes and defining the identity of the Muslim community as a religious group as compared to Jews or Christians or others. Here, by meeting Prophet Muhammad, Al-Bistami, in a similar fashion, could be seen as deriving from this encounter a religious legitimacy, but this time, one inside the wider Muslim community, a legitimacy among Sufis in whose circles this narrative was probably transmitted, first of all. Similarly, this also gives a special aspect to the identity of the Sufi community among Muslims, a sort of elite identity, and this is alluded to in the beginning of the text, where it is explained that an experience, this experience cannot be lived by the lay people, Al-Matunas, though they are, they are also presumably Muslim. Another interesting aspect of this narrative is the character and role of the angels, which, apart from the green bird, are the only characters met by al during his ascension to God. The first remark we can make is that although on his way to God he seems to meet many angels, if not all of them, there is no mention of the Archangel Gabriel, Jibril. This may be underlined that Gabriel is seen or sent to only prophets and not mystics or Sufi masters. And this is a way, a way of not putting oneself as quite on the same level as the prophets. The word Nur is associated most of the time with angels from the first Heaven, where angels comments that the visitor al is al Nuri, fitting with the well-known hadith mentioning that angels are made from Nur, which is the light in the dark, in opposition to jinn made from fire and made from clay. Throughout the text, descriptions of the appearance and acts of the angels are positive, except in a few instances. Indeed, when al refuses the offers, they are sometimes described negatively by him, like mosquitoes, Kalboroza. Overall, this gives an interesting impression of angels, slightly different from the classically pure beings obeying to God, in which case one would suppose that they would only encourage and study in his mystical travels. However, on the contrary, in this text, one of their primary roles, aside from praying and love in the different heavens, seemingly testing the travelers on their path to God. <clears throat> they active, actively try to entice them to riches or even to what appear as perfectly good actions, such as praying alongside them. And only when Abistani, understanding the nature of the test and insisting on traveling on, do an angel appear to that company him by the hand to the next heaven. This cursory glance on this aspect of the text gives an interesting picture of the relationship between angels and believers in Islamic cosmology. And it somehow reminds us of a Quranic verse, which is the 216 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Fighting has been prescribed for you, though it is hateful for you. But it may be that you hate a thing, though it be good for you, and it may be that you love a thing, though it be evil for you, but knows and you know. This here could reflect the need to confront even essentially good creatures, such as angels, if one is to meet God, and on the need to travel on and not settling down, even though that might sound more comfortable. This, in turn, would, could, would illustrate some core aspects of the Sufi ethos. To conclude, this particular mi'raj is interesting first as part of the legacy of the mi'raj stories developed around the prophets, in the sense of legacy developed by Den Denis Spelder and used by Guru Bukovic in her study on the prophet's mi'raj, and I quote, Legacy is what is created after an individual's life is lived. It is the record of creative expression and reflections in others, reflecting on the life of a given individual. The focus on legacy recognizes the scholarship and hermeneutics of their own histories. The scholarly enterprise is not protected from the vicissitudes that surround other methods of text production. Thus, legal text, Quranic interpretation, hadith collection, and biographies are evaluated as human, authored, and invested accounts. 
she further continues in saying that legacy engages the history of interpretation and focuses on how particular historical factors in particular historical moments construct meaning and use the nearby as the one way to create, confirm, and redefine community and ideology. As such, the invested account of al Islamic Mihraj can also be seen more particularly as the first known example of the legacy of a number of Sufi ascension stories that were to come. Reinforcing the legitimization process of this account is the Sufi community, in the Sufi community is the fact that this narrative is attributed to a well-known religious figure who lived in what Bukovic calls the classical period of Islamic historiography said between the 1st and 3rd Hegerian centuries, a period during which different prophetic mihraj and hadith were put in written form. Reading Bistami's mihraj through this sense can tell us more about major Sufi figures' representation, the communities revolving around them afterwards, and how they define themselves, more than about the factual occurrence of this story, or whether the historical Al-Bistani is at the origin of this account, which some scholars doubt. In any case, for the Sufi community, Nazir al-Azma reminds us, and I quote, that explicitly or implicitly, the impact of the story of the Mirvaj and Sufi literature was powerful in terms of expression, structure and form, and in symbology and allegory. The story symbolized the Sufi path with its complex order of stages and states, and provided the mystics with a frame of reference for their experiences and contemplations. As said above, they used this allegory power to express the themes of communion with God and regeneration of the soul, and so popularize their beliefs in order to convert the masses to, the, to their faith. Though this last part is in contradiction to what a superficial reading of al Islamic Islam indicated regarding the Ahmad Nas, we can see that this type, we can see this type of Sufi literature as a particular example of the function Bukovic saw 